Are you ready? Stand by. Welcome, everybody, to the Three Gun Show. I'm your host, Dave Hartman, and with me this week is special guest Larry Hauk. Larry is uh, man, kind of a kind of a legend, I guess, in the uh, in the Three Gun world. Uh, he was on Team FN, which was one of the the biggest Three Gun teams of all time. Uh, groundbreaking at the time. Uh, worked for uh, FNH. Was responsible for the uh, the FNH Three Gun Championship, and he pioneered several things, which, uh, which I found out in this podcast. One of them was the half day format, which is kind of crazy. We get into that too. Uh, Larry and I talk about many different topics, including his, uh, his new gig at Black Hawk, uh, Black Hawk's doing some, uh, interesting things after years of, of not being so interesting. So we get into that as well. And I don't hold back and, uh, Larry's a gracious host. So two things that I want to tell you before we get started here, one uh, we had a little bit of audio feedback, so when I speak, you can kind of hear me talking through uh, Larry's speaker, so sorry about that. Um, just bear with us. It's actually not too bad. Uh, we can get through it here. So if I sound like I'm stuttering and everything, it was because I was hearing myself talking. It was kind of weird, but um, I think you'll be okay. And the second one is uh, if you if you follow me on Instagram at the 3 Gun Show, or 3 Gun Show, um, you know that we got kicked off of iTunes for two weeks and, uh, we were back on. So if you're hearing this podcast and you're subscribed to the podcast, then, uh, then it was seamless to you because you're subscribed to our RSS feed. But if you don't subscribe and you just look for that show on a weekly basis, uh, you probably missed it for a while. And, uh, but we're back now and you can find the three gun show on the iTunes store or Apple Podcasts, whatever the heck they call it now. And uh, we're not going to let them hold us down. But the thing is, you got to subscribe to the podcast because if it goes away again, you will be subscribed to our RSS feed. Uh, and uh, if not, you can always find it at 3gunshow.com. And uh, 3gunshow.com slash listen has a bunch of different ways to listen, including that RSS feed. And if you're thinking, Dave, what's an RSS feed and you want to reach out to me, I don't know any better than you do. Just Google it. It'll explain it way better than I can. But we're back. We're back in iTunes. We're not letting them hold us down. So make sure you subscribe to all the stuff there so you can get all the good stuff in the future. All right. End of my ramble here. You enjoy this podcast with Larry Houck. Welcome, everybody, to the Three Gun Show. I'm your host, Dave Hartman, and we've got a special interview tonight with guest Larry Houck. Larry, welcome to the show. Hey, Dave. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh man, it's great to uh, it's great to have you. So uh, the the Larry Hauk of Three Guns. So a lo- lot of months ago, I wanted to have you on the show. Uh, our schedules didn't line up for whatever reason, and just recently, FN the big FN match came up again, and I was like, man, we got to get Larry on again. And uh, I got a a young lady that's booking up the show, and she did a fantastic job, and she figured that out before I even told her. And here you are. Yeah, it actually was was funny when I got the uh, message. I'm like, yeah, I'm happy to be there, and uh, the dates actually worked out really good because uh, I happened to be in a downtime for work in between two two events and uh, heading out uh, Thursday to obviously NRA annual meetings is coming up. So, yeah, it's a big one. Yeah, so you're uh, you're working for Vista Outdoors now. You're uh, at uh, Black Hawk. And you said you're you're in Kansas. Do they have offices there? Are you like deployed or what? Well, they, they used to. Um, obviously, Vista, Vista is a big ship. Yeah. And um, I work for specifically for the the tactical uh, global product unit, which um, handles Eagle, Blackhawk, and Uncle Mike's. So I'm primarily handle Blackhawk and Uncle Mike's, uh, senior product manager for holsters and duty gear. Um, we were based here out of. Overland Park, Kansas, um, specifically the old, if you know the remember the old Bushnell office. So uh, with that, I moved to Kansas three years ago, and just most recently, um, a change in the business unit uh, to put the headquarters back at Virginia Beach. So 
son senior in high school. I just couldn't up and pick him up and uh, move to Virginia Beach. So they're allowing me to work remotely here out of my house. Matter of yeah, fact, that- you're sitting in my, you're looking at my office uh, through the camera view. It's it's stunning. I've got some cabinets back there with some story stuff in. You do not want to look at the rest of it because it's just boxes of stuff. <laughs> Yeah, that's the same thing. The uh, the other day, I put a picture of my my workbench up here on uh, on Instagram, and people gave me a hard time about how clean it is. And I was like, "Well, the camera points back this way; the the mess is over there." Yeah, you definitely. Uh, it's amazing what we do on can show on camera. Just don't look off camera. <laughs> yeah, pretty much right. That's the uh, that's the idea. Yeah, this uh, this looks like a you know work work area. You know, like a like a cabin or something like that but uh it's it's a studio it's built from scratch to look like that yep yeah it's um if you want it went down in my man cave slash gun room my my wife doesn't go down there at all she goes there's just stuff everywhere and uh, you know you got little workspaces here and there and that's that's how you do stuff because you never know when you might need that part so you stick it in a place and hang on to it because i've had parts from when i originally started shooting back in the early 90s I need them one day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The uh, those are the best parts to to have too, because uh, there's always that one situation where you're like, man, I know I saw that. I feel like it was 17 years ago, but I bet I can find it. <laughs> you know, it, it's a funny story is when we moved out here. I had so much stuff. I didn't want the movers obviously moving it. I, they couldn't move ammo and stuff. So I actually went out and spent about seven thousand dollars on an enclosed trailer just to move all my gun stuff and accessories and things to Kansas. So yeah, I'm not sure the wife was too happy about that one. (laughs) (laughs) That seems like a lot. (laughs) Yeah. Totally worth it though. Oh yeah. 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 I've got portable storage now in my my, uh, driveway. (laughs) Yeah. So Larry, you've been in the, uh, the firearms industry for a long time then. So how did this start? Did this start out as like a passion for you and then turn into a career or was it vice versa? Well, it, it, it really started out as a Friday night friend. Hey, let's go shooting. And we, we were actually stationed together in, uh, Fort Carson, Colorado, uh, Ah. 1991. So we started shooting on just going to the range on Friday nights and, uh, they had a bowling pin league. So we started shooting bowling pins on Friday night, and well, then they that leads to Ipsic USPSA. Found that on the weekends. That led to some other shooting. That led to three gun, and next thing you know, twenty eight years later, I'm still shooting. Oh, that's pretty cool. So uh, you were so for Carson, you were in the army then. Yep. Yep. Got it. How long did you do that? I was on active duty for almost seven years and got to really shoot the really big guns that travel really fast across country. I was on an Abrams tank. Oh, no kidding. Yep. Sounds like fun. Yeah, those things haul butt. Yeah, they um, they definitely um, have a huge fun factor. Until you break something. Then it's... Uh, then your downtime is extended <laughs> because yeah, there's no nothing kidding. easy to fix on a tank. Well, and it's not like you can uh, just call the wrecker, put it on the back and take it somewhere either. Right. Actually they do have tank wreckers. Do they really? Yeah. It's called a M88 recoil. When I was on, I could do is M88 recovery vehicle. Um, but now they've put those on uh, Abrams chassis because the 88 chassis was a old sixties chassis. And uh, it's got a big, huge crane. If you if you Google an M88 recovery vehicle, it's got a big, massive crane on top of it. It's it's pretty cool. Got a big blade in front that's got to go down when they start winching and stuff because, um, you know, the tanks are sixty what sixty eight tons something like that. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, oh, those are huge. Turns out you can yeah. buy them surplus, by the way. Well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> In case you ever need one. <laughs> Well, so that, did you, when you got out of the army, did you immediately go into the, uh, the outdoor industry? No, no. I went to work for my dad. Okay. And so when did the, uh, was, when did the firearms, uh, end of it come into, uh, your career? Oh, uh, probably about three years after I got out of the, out of the service. Um, I actually went and started in law enforcement and, um, right after nine 11, I started doing a lot of firearms training for private security. Of course, anytime that was at that time, 
everybody was chasing a lot of money because there was a lot of private contract stuff out there after 9-11. So, um, you know, did that and then went back to law enforcement. And uh, about 2012 um, is when I actually went into the firearms industry, I actually went to work for FN as a full-time employee. Okay. And so what did, uh, what did you do at FN when you started there? I was um, first started as an assistant product manager and then worked my way over to uh, really doing a lot of work for the sales side, sales and marketing. And I was a uh, dealer support manager for Eastern half of the United States. Okay. Well, so I, I came into uh, three gun like 2011 and pretty much shot locally until uh, 2016. So got to treat me like I've never heard any of these stories before. And <laughs> so tell, tell me everything. You know, they'll so, still think like, Oh, I'm not going to tell Dave this because uh, he already knows this. Like, I, you know, this is all, all cool, uh, interesting stuff to me. And I love hearing the backstory where things came from. And uh, actually, you know, you're involved in one of the more legendary matches of all time in three guns. So I want to get into that as well. Okay. Well, I actually really found three gun back in 2006. Um, two guys, uh, Dean Turk and Matt Nagel, we shot, shot a lot of local matches with them. And you probably know Dean. He's from Pennsylvania. The guys are from the Pennsylvania area. And yeah, that's where I've, I live. I've, I've shot I, with I, Dean I several times, and he's been on the show. Yeah, Dean's a great guy. And yep. um, he talks me into about 2006. Hey, they're having this, this team event. Well, it's kind of like, okay, never shot three guns. I, well, Dean, I kind of don't have a rifle. Let me throw something together here and uh, put an ACOG on top of a rifle. Totally the wrong optic to shoot uh considering the farthest we shot that that day was like 75 80 yards <laughs> maybe nice. 100 if we were lucky a little and, hard on, um, on three power oh yeah yeah it was all three power and i'm like okay i'm trying to start through the scope and everything's like it was it was all so i truly wasn't there for my rifle skills i was there for my handgun skills because up to that point, I shot a lot of USPSA, you know, achieved master class level. So Dean and, and Matt really handled the rifle aspect of it, shotgun aspect of it. And I just kind of cleaned up with the handgun what I could. And if I remember correctly, we either won it or finished second. So that was kind of like really cool. And then um, Dean's like, hey, we got to go down to Fort Benning to this three gun match. So, like, okay, we, we go to Fort Benning. That was a real eye opener because, you know, at that point in time, loading a shotgun off the side saddle one round at a time. If you got one round in the gun in a second, you were, you were fast. Um, I was still struggling like around eight rounds at 10, 12 seconds. So it just wasn't smooth for me. But um, then I, I moved to New Mexico because I took a job down there as a lieutenant with the police department for uh, White Sands Missile Range. And August time frame of well, it would have been it would have been July of 2009. Tommy Thacker from FN calls me up, says, "Hey, what are you doing?" I said, "I'm standing in my garage." He goes, "No, silly, what are you doing for sponsorship or shooting?" I'm like, "Not really anything. I'm just having a good time." Because you want to shoot for us? I'm like, "Who's us?" He says, "FN." Well, I knew that FN made a 249 from the military. I'm like, like sweet, okay, I get a saw. What am I shooting? <laughs> I said, "What am I shooting?" He goes, "How about a scar?" I'm like. Oh, that's the new cool battle rifle. Oh, yeah. So he sends me the scar. And I'm literally got a month to get ready for Rocky Mountain. Maybe I didn't have that long. Maybe it was two weeks. And uh, I got this ACOG that I won from, Not, I'm sorry, not ACOG, but a one to four that I won from uh, Trigicon that I won from uh, Fort Benning. And so I throw that on top of the scar and go out. Matter of fact, I've still got pictures of, you know, sighting it in and everything. And uh, I go shoot this match and just have a good time. Back to that, that single loading again with the shotgun. Um, got an SLP and we uh, we were shooting at the uh, FNX-9 at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, the FNS hadn't come out yet. So the next year was the official launch of the team, which FN was the first major three-gun team. Um, that I can recall in three gun. So it was cool. We got a lot of sponsors such as Mac tools. No one ever, you know, everybody knows what Mac tools is if you race, but when you think about Mac tools in the firearms industry, unheard of. 
Um, we had Polaris as a sponsor, another great outdoor product, but not specific for the firearms industry. All hunters have Polaris, you know, trap skeet shooters all have Polaris razors and things like that. That's when a razor uh, just come out. So we were starting to get a lot of traction within not only the shooting industry, but outside the shooting industry. And, um, you know, we had a truck Ford Raptor. Uh, with a tandem axle enclosed trailer that we hauled the razor around in. And uh, we really formed the team. The first team consisted of Ken Fowl, Tommy Thacker, um, uh, Dinah Leidorf, Tanya Erickson, which was Tanya Hanish at the time, Mark Hanish, and uh, some guy by the name of Dave Neth out of Idaho. You ever hear of that guy? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, Dave like kind of has disappeared a little bit, but uh, Dave's, Dave's a great guy. So that formed the core of our shooting team. And, you know, the made FN sponsored a match out in uh, CMMG's range. It was the uh, FNHUSA Midwest three gun. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we all get, get there for the match and, you know, we've got three gun nation kind of start kicking off and, and things. So, you know, you talk about how the FN match, I know you mentioned you wanted to talk about that, how it came about. Well, it came about because of that match. Um, it rained a lot that weekend, so much that I had, we all went to the local store and bought boots to wear because our shoes were just caked full of mud. And um, I mean, mud was in some places, it was 12 inches deep. It was so deep in one shooting area that they had to tether the plates to the stands because when you knocked it off, you couldn't find the plate in the mud. It was <laughs> Dave. I, I, I never seen so much mud in all my life. So, uh, but there was a lot of things that, that I had seen through the years of shooting USPSA and putting on a USPSA match that wasn't done at that match for the benefits of the shooter. The shooters are the customers in three guns. And you have to take your three gun match or any shooting match and you have to run it like a business. You mm -hmm. treat it just like a business with the shooters or participants being your customer. And that's your sole focus because without a customer, your business doesn't exist. So, I mean, that's, that's a good point. And it, it makes sense from like a, a the most basic standpoint there possibly is, but how how is it that a lot of matches miss that part of it? What do they think they're doing other than putting on an event for customers? Um, first is the fun factor. You've got to make the event fun because there's there's very few people in this industry that shoot for a living and make a salary off just attending matches and shooting in the prizes. Right. That makes sense. The second thing that I can tell anybody that wants to be a match director, don't shoot only at your local club and say, hey, I'm going to put this big match on. Dave, I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't invent stuff. I didn't come up with those great ideas. I'm the best thief there is. <laughs> when I say that, and that's all in good fun because imitation is a sincere form of flattery. And because I had the privilege of being able to travel to so many different matches, not only as just a shooter, but a, but a, a, a sponsored shooter, I could see what matches did well and I could see what matches didn't do well. And I would make notes and those notes ultimately I took bits and pieces out of all the matches to put it into one match and and come up with a with a good format. I mean, there was a lot of first in three in the FN three gun match that was not done before. And and I always like a challenge when somebody says, "Ah, oh, you can't do that." Well, so give us an example of uh, something that people do in matches that um, that they shouldn't be doing. And then on the other side of it, give us a couple examples of something that um, that they should be doing. Well, one of the biggest things that I can I can give a new match director piece of advice is plan, plan, plan. And when I say plan, the biggest mistake I see people doing is trying to fit 
a 60 round combined with all three guns course of fire with a long reset time and you have 15 people on a squad and you got a, a, an hour time window. You have just set yourself up for disaster. When it takes the average person, you know, 160 minutes or 140 mi uh, uh, seconds, I'm sorry, to shoot that course of fire, then you've got all the reset. Well, you're now six minutes from shot to shot. When I say shot to shot, that's timer start to the next timer starts. That's the window that you have to get that shooter through. They've got to load their guns up, get them positioned, execute the course of fire, and the course is reset for the next shooter. If that's six minutes and you have 15 people on a squad, that's 90 minutes. If you trying to fit that into a one hour window, there is no way that's going to work because, oh, by the way, you've got a stage briefing and stage walkthrough to do. Yeah. So if it takes five minutes to read the briefing, then you get five or 10 minutes to do the walkthrough. Your entire stage time for that squad is now 175 minutes. And you gave and yourself an hour. Matches get behind. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, that makes sense. So what, uh, what should they be doing then? Well, what they should be doing is looking at the course of fire and saying, I've never had somebody walk off of a course of fire that has kind of, I don't want to say burned through, but effectively shot the course of fire quickly to their ability and done it well. And walk off, I was like, man, I was upset at that stage. I don't want to shoot that stage again. All I hear is like, man, I want to shoot that stage again. That is the good course of fire that you want to aim for. And you want to aim for about a three to four minute turn time from that stop to stop. Because if the course is so long that, you know, 50 or 60 percent of your paying customers are timing out on the stage, that stage is way too long. So what do you think is like an adequate amount of time out on a stage? There's got to be some, I right? Try to shoot, I try to shoot for 10% or less. Okay. Uh, it seems like a like a reasonable number. If you're talking like a 200-person match, then that's going to be 20 people. And then, yeah, I mean, if you figure, you know, well, you got your 100% shooters, your 70%. That makes sense. Yeah. So, and, and here's the thing. That 10% equates to, if you look at it in USPSA standards, the target group of the majority of USPSA shooters are B class, anywhere from a high C to a low A and incorporating the B class. That is the group that you really want to target. So that's a bulk of your shooters. You're going to have your new shooters, your first time at a major match shooter. That's those 10% that probably made time out. Um, you know, obviously you always want to have a zero because let's face it. If I try to build a course of fire where Greg Jordan, Daniel Horner, Taryn Butler, Jerry Mishlick, any of those really, really good shooters. It's super difficult for them, and they're running up in a, in a say, 120 or 160-second course of fire, even 180-second course of fire, and they're in that, you know, 80th percent of that. When I say 80th percent, their, you know, their time is 125 seconds to 140 seconds. The average person is not even going to make – complete that course of fire before time's out. No, not even half of it. <laughs> right. So that's, you know, and I'm, I'm not, you know, I love Greg, love Daniel. I'm not building the course of fire for them because those guys, the good shooters are always going to figure out how to navigate that course of fire effectively, efficiently, and accurately. Right. <clears throat> well, like you said, like the, uh, the B class shooter, that's like the, the bulk of the people that are going to be at the match. Right. Like those Correct. are going to be, that's the, that's the if pain. You've got like a, yeah, if you've got like a bell curve, they're going to be at the the big part of that bell. Yep, that makes sense. Well, so you, you talked about some first in FN with that background of like what we should be doing, what we shouldn't be doing. What were some firsts that you did uh, at the FN match? And actually, maybe let's take a step back real quick. Like, how? Why did you start? Uh, did you guys start the FN match? 
I'm a glutton for punishment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, anytime I talk to the match director, I'm like, why are you doing this? <laughs> well, keep in mind, I ran a USPSA match, and anybody that was back on the East Coast that was shooting from 2001 to 2008 uh, knew about a match called the Summer Blast. Um, that started out as, hey, I want to do a match. It was a fundraiser for the, for the FOP that later turned into fundraisers for the juniors and uh, the local um, – club and it went from Fredericksburg, Virginia to York PA. That match was about having fun. And I enjoyed watching people come off stage and saying, Hey, I want to shoot that course again. Kind of missed that when I moved to New Mexico. Um, but then that match when we were at um, the FN Midwest three gun, I actually kind of approached Ken Fowl said, Hey, I said, uh, you know, there's some things here that I'm saying that, you know, our name is because I, I was associated with FN at the time. So our name was attached to it. I said, you know, I really, this is good, but I think we can do it better. He goes, okay. He goes, put me a proposal together. So I put a proposal together. Um, Tommy said, Hey, there's a new range opening up uh, Peacemaker National Training Center. And uh, we were actually the first major match that they hosted there in 2011. And uh, I swear to this day, I think I gave, Cole, the owner, four heart attacks, three aneurysms, <laughs> and uh, six near-death experiences. I tell you what, like that, I I don't doubt that because like if you're if you're talking about like a like a new match, like I've been burned a lot on going to a match and it's not what you expect. Now a new yeah. range, you're like uh, I don't know if if they're going to be cool, but you got a new match and a new range. Now, Dave's now keep in mind, not one. only. Did we have a, a new match, a new range, no infrastructure? Because when I saw the range on December of 2010, they were still cutting trees down and saying, hey, the bays are going to be over here. We can kind of shoot over here. We can. I'm looking at this. I mean, they, they had equipment on there grinding tree limbs up. That's how <laughs> new this was. And uh, I was like, oh. Oh, I mean, you know, having that anxiety attack and I, okay. So we get there for setup and only 50% of the bays were built because they ran into problems because they hit rock. I'm like, Oh crap. So I had to shift some stages and luckily in three gun, you can do that with, with some ease. Uh, we were able to adapt and overcome and, and uh, put a good match on the ground. So that was kind of unique, but the best part about, the, the FN three gun was I pulled something from Fort Benning that I absolutely loved. Um, and that was also part of the summer blast as well too. Fort Benning at the time was the only three gun match where you just showed up and shot. You didn't have to reset a target because they pulled all the guys that were um, recycling through, through the ranger school or waiting for a ranger school to uh, start. And they pulled them over to reset targets and stuff. I said, can I do this? at our match and I was able to figure out how I could do it. So that was great where you just, you just showed up and, and shot. You didn't have to do anything, but what that does for you, a couple things is a, it allows a, an RO to immediately score a target or see a target and your scoring and your reset actually comes, goes faster because your, your crew on that stage gets a system down. So now I'm reducing my stage time from that start to start again. But what else I did that was really, really cool, and I was told it could never be done and keep the match on time, was run a three-gun match in a half-day format. Because everything up to that time was you shoot an hour, hour and a half on, you're an hour and a half off. Well, you're sitting on the, st on the, the range the entire day. And I don't know about you, but starting and stopping, it just for me, that was, man, I want to go, and I want to go, get the stages done, and then I'm done. You know, and, uh, for, we uh, we were able to accomplish for, that for a long time. Like I, I've said, like the on-off format, it does not work for me because I'll I'll shoot, I'll get so amped up, and then I'll, we're done resetting, and, and then after that, I'm like end up falling asleep on my tailgate. Like I'll have that crash of now I'm not allowed to, or I'm not supposed to do anything, and then when it's time to go shoot, like I'm, I just woke up from a nap. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Which is hilarious to think that. uh 
that people said the half day format couldn't work because like the bulk of matches I go to is half day format. Well, but it goes back to that planning of hey, this is I know I got to set a stage for this many minutes, and I can only have this many people on a squad because I got to figure the stage reading and then the briefing. And we instead of up until that point in time, also you had a five minute walkthrough, just like USPSA. Well, that's fine if your stage total length is only 15 or 16 yards, but in three gun, you, you're running sometimes 30, 40, 50 yards. Well, mm -hmm. by the time I get done and locate all the targets, all right, first shooter to the box. Well, well crap. You know, I got no time to get develop a stage plan. I'm back in the back, kind of looking over people's shoulders. How's that stage plan? Oh, I, don't, I hope I don't miss any of them. So we we actually instituted a ten minute walkthrough. Huh? So you did all that uh, truncated all the time, and then added a ten minute walkthrough in there. Mm -hmm. Huh? Interesting. Yeah, but our, our our squads were like ten people, ten twelve people. How many people so, were shooting the match? Yeah. So you had, but you got to remember. Those guys were there to do nothing but shoot. You didn't have to corral the cats after reset or get them to go down to reset. So they're right there yeah. ready all the time to go shoot. So that actually, while it sounds like, well, that can't work because, you know, it's no way they can work out. But it actually worked out really well because the shooters were, were ready to go because the only thing they had to do was shoot. And how many shooters did you have at the match total? The last year was 348, including wow. the staff. That's incredible. And in 2014, we gave we had on the prize table 148 guns. Damn. That's insane. That's why it was the to go match. You not yeah. only had fun, you only had to shoot, but we had a kick ass prize table. All right, now I feel like I missed out on something. <laughs> you did. <laughs> yeah, apparently. So what's Dylan, the next match Dylan you Larry? <laughs> he tells me constantly, man, I was ready to go to the next year, and you, you guys stopped it. I'm like, oh, I, didn't, I didn't really stop it. FN decided to stop it. <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, so next year, the Blackhawk Larry Hawk Invitational. <laughs> no? Okay. No, 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 no. No, no, no. 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 Um, <laughs> well, so – one one thing the reason that your name came up uh came up recently is uh <clears throat> I've had a discussion with several people after uh going to several matches this year already and uh finding good competent uh actually just willing ROs is is becoming more and more difficult and it seems like uh the the culture is I'm here to shoot I paid my I paid my money I don't owe anything else to the sport so, so you now have, you now have a match that's on the complete other end of the spectrum where you have fully staffed. Could that be done today? Sure could be. Yeah. And all I'd have to do is send out an email, and depending upon the location and time of year, I could probably get a majority of that match staff back because we took care of the match staff. And let me explain to you why. Yeah. This sport starts out with volunteers. Without volunteers of the sport, you can't have a sport because if I had to pay the staff a wage, your match fee would be about $1,500. Yep. Okay. So we have to take those people and we have to take care of them. And what I did as a match director is I brought the match staff in on they could come in on Tuesday. I had the room available for them Tuesday night. They shot the match on Wednesday and Thursday. So they weren't trying to jam everything into a half-day format. Oh, I'm sorry, a one-day format, all nine stages. So I gave them basically two days. While they were on the range, we fed them. We gave them all shirts. I think they got three match shirts, and I picked up a sponsor for those match T-shirts. So you'd have a nice logo on the back says FNHUSA three gun championship and then the sponsor logo on it or left chest or whatever. So I didn't have to take that out of match fund. The sponsor, it's another marketing opportunity. Um, we covered all their hotel rooms while they were there. We had a staff banquet on Friday night. That was a catered staff banquet. And we actually had prizes settle, set aside for the match staff 
and I will never forget Black Rain Ordnance. Um, the first time they came, um, I invited them because I worked with them at, at one of the matches and the guys, I invited them to come. And every year after that, the, including that year, they put up a gun just for the staff because when they saw everything that I, I laid out and did for the staff, they wanted to be a part of that. So they become they became the premier sponsor for the, the match staff because those guys worked matches. They knew what was in it and they wanted to take care of the staff. And then what we also allowed the, the staff to do was walk the prize table in order of finish where they shot the match. Um, that was the fairest way that I thought that I could take care of the staff. I ask a lot of the staff. I ask a lot of hours out of them, but it's also one of those things of taking care of them. And I can tell you, um, you know, my wife really hated the week of the match, the week prior to the match, because I was probably leaving the house at 5 a.m. in the morning and not getting home until midnight. But my philosophy of leadership is I'm not going to ask you to be on the range if I'm not there on the range working with you. Right. Yeah, that makes total sense. <clears throat> yeah, so the uh, – I guess it comes down to incentives, right? Uh, just like everything in life. It's like what it's, it's incentives, incentives can you provide to ROs? But just like anything we do within the shooting industry, it's also about relationships that you build. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I would go work matches. I'd work with people. And it's like, hey, you want to come work our match or whatever? Um, and there's a lot of people that the only match that they worked every year was the FN match. And um, yeah. they, they loved it because of the incentives that we offered. But we also, it was like a family environment, a family get together every year and and i mean i i tell you what i i could not put that match on if it wouldn't be for my match staff and two people that i'll give a shout out to that were really instrumental in it was howard thompson who also was involved with the york isaac walton league shooting and then uh aj williams um who i actually got started i got him started in shooting um way early and uh he, those two guys are you know, Howard was my uh, range master uh, operations and AJ was my basically the guy that if something broke, he was there to fix it immediately just like that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, two super important guys in the, uh, in the match game for sure. Any, any good match director, if I could give somebody a piece of advice of being a one to be a match director, if you surround yourself with good people, give them the guidance, their left and right boundary. Here's our start point. Here's our end point and you let them go do great things, you'd be surprised what people can accomplish. Do you uh, do you still shoot three-gun matches? I do. Do you see the same thing that I'm seeing as far as uh, it seems like the volunteerism isn't really prevalent or talked about in the sport? It, yes. Um, and, it's, and it's sad that I see it um, because – there's matches running with skeleton crews. Sometimes I've seen only one RO on a stage. And yeah, the last two from, matches I've been at, I've seen the match director running timers. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, well, there's, there's, uh, well, I think some of it has to do with our own. How do I want to say this without sounding wrong, but it's kind of our own greed um, because 10 years ago, there were five or six major three gun matches. And then there wasn't any local three gun matches. It was USPSA or IDPA. Now, three gun has become almost like USPSA. You can shoot a three gun match every weekend, whether it be a local, state, or regional or, or national match. Yeah. So now, because we have put more demands on people, people only have so much vacation, oh, so much time they, they can commit to it. And you know, that's what we're starting to see that you just don't have the volunteers there anymore. Like you used to. Yeah. So do you think it's like the, uh, kind of like the sponsor thing we're drawing from the same pool. So it appears Very that much. that we're, that we've got less participation, but we have the same amount. Yep. Yeah. Okay. We've put more demands on the calendar with the same number of people. And we either have to do one of two things, increase the number of people or decrease the number of matches. Mm -hmm. and you increase the number of people by, hey, if you're going to shoot, a, shoot any matches, go volunteer at a match. Um, you know, if you've never volunteered at a match, 
you're missing a great training opportunity. And allow me to expand on that for a moment. That training opportunity is when you run that timer, that clipboard, you get to see every single shooter come through that stage to see how they shot it correctly or not correctly. And you get to witness the really good shooters. And you know what? You can learn from, I learned more from watching guys like Todd Jarrett, Jerry Mishlick, um, Scott Warren, that I, I shot a lot with on the East Coast, that when they would go through a stage and how they would pick it apart and set up here, set up there, angles and things like that, then I could have been done in any training session the amount of bullets that I put down range. Yeah, I mean, that's that's really true. Um, the uh, the Texas Three Gun Championship, I did uh, filming for um, like a, a video I just put together <clears throat> that I'm really proud of actually, but uh, it's on YouTube. Check it out if you're watching on YouTube right now. <laughs> but um, in the editing process, I noticed so much more from all the shooters that I had doing the exact same stage and the exact same thing. And breaking that down and watching those videos over and over and over again, man, I, I can't believe like in the last like two weeks, like I had like so many breakthrough epiphanies. <laughs> exactly. And, and you know, there's, there's a saying that I have when I tell new guys or new gals that are shooting. The top shooters don't practice to get it right. They practice so they don't get it wrong. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just, that's resounded with me for so many years is, um, you know, and then they also only do the necessary amount of movement to execute what they need to do. I mean, I watch so many new shooters waste so much time and all the excess movement. For example, you draw the handgun and then you take a step to your shooting position. Well, that step just costs you time. And being an RO, I watched all of that non-extra movement and figured out, hey, these guys are only doing the, the movement necessary to complete the task at hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, so the uh, I guess it just comes back to the same thing. So one of the, the, the concepts that I've been thinking about recently, and, and I'd like to hear your op opinion on this, is uh, there's – there's still, even now in 2019, like so many matches popping up. Hey, we're going to do this new match. Hey, we're going to do this new match. Hey, we're going to do this new match. But it's still a three-gun match, right? Mm -hmm. So my advice when people come to me is like, hey, what do you think of this format? I always think like, well, where are you located? There's a match within three hours of you right now. Why don't you go help that match? And make it like amazing, you know, instead of starting your own. And, and now you've got two pretty good matches. Like work with the, the match director and make like one amazing match. It's also, I agree with that 100%, but it also, it also has another taxing on it that people don't think about all the time. And that is the supporters of the match. Not only through your customers being your paid participants, yeah, but your sponsors. And, you know, where I talked about earlier about the volunteers pulling on that pool without increasing the number of volunteers, well, the, the sponsors are the same way. We went from six or eight major three-gun matches to now 60. Well, those sponsors can't support all of them at a $10,000 level. I was a sponsor coordinator for FN. I can tell you the number of requests we would get for sponsorship and stuff. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why we did the contingency program as another way to, to pay back to the sport. Um, mm -hmm. But we had to then start looking at how we can minimize and spread that same amount of money year after year over more. And you're right, Dave. I mean, without a doubt, instead of starting another three gun, partner with another organization or another match and help make that match the best match there is. And, and I think we'll, we'll we'll see a lot of good come out of that versus just another match to, to, for somebody to shoot. And, and yeah. don't get me wrong, I don't want to discourage anybody from from starting a match. I know it's uh, a tough but, one because like, as a shooter, but, you, you think know, like, "Hey, more shooting opportunities." That sounds awesome. Yeah, I mean, more shooting opportunities is great, but you also want to make sure the product that you're putting forward is no no different than what I do on a daily basis. I need to differentiate myself from the competition. And how can I get that consumer to spend money? Mm -hmm. Apply that same standard to the match. And whatever you do, 
whatever somebody does, they're deciding to start a match. Do not think you can plan something and be effective in three to four months. It took me the first FN match I started in May, thinking about it, May of 2010, and it went on the ground November of 2011. Oh, yeah, okay. It does take a long time then. And then while well, we were finishing one year, I was announcing the date for the next year. So I'm already 12 months out working on it. Right. Yeah, there's really no like uh, rest period for a match director. It's like you got to go right no, back into uh, marketing. <clears throat> the only time a match director has any kind of really rest is after the first round is fired because the range master then takes over. Yeah. So you got like three days. Nap time. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Well, <laughs> let me ask you then. Uh, so the you, you seem to um, understand like concepts of differentiation, um, market placement and things like that. What do you think about like uh, marketing a match? Like from, from a match staff standpoint, like you got your, your match director and like your various cadre of like executive uh, staff. Like how how did you market the FN match and and did you or did people just come? Was it is it like the right time to to be selling biscuits? Um, well, it was a little bit of the right time, and a lot of personal commitment of going to other matches and say, hey, we're we're going to be putting on this match. You need to come shoot the ma the FN match. Um, I don't know if you know uh, Manuel Bragg shoots a lot of USPSA. Manny Bragg. Yeah, um, I never will not forget. personally. I know who he is. Uh, I never will forget he was a junior coordinator and I took over for him at U the USPSA as a junior coordinator. And he said, you all know Larry, because he's the guy that walks around to every match saying, Hey, you need to come shoot the summer blast. And, and that's actually accurate. I did that. Um, and you know, the summer blast ended up being 352 shooters. I think um, the last year I did it. So and we ran it on half day format as well too, but we shot 10 USPSA stages in half day format. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, there's a half day format theme with me, as you can see. <laughs> yeah. Well, it seems to but, be uh, adopted by a lot of the industry. But yeah, it's, you've got to have, you have to be as committed to the match to make it successful as somebody is committed to showing up, shooting and winning the match. Mm-hmm. So, um, so your marketing strategy then is like individuals and going out to other matches, shooting, saying, "Hey, come to my match." Correct. And then you know you also, um, I was fortunate enough that I had already a history of the of the USPSA match. I think I started out the first year. We had 125 shooters show up to the Summer Blast in 2001. We ended up with I think 352 the last year in 2008. Tremendous growth. But, you know, your, your local clubs, your area, they also would help. You know, obviously with USPSA, we had an advertising section in the magazine. They also helped with three-gun matches. We were able to advertise in that as well. But the Brian Eno's form was a huge help. Uh, three-gun nation was a huge help to be able to start kind of promoting that stuff and things. And obviously that was the infancy of three-gun nation. But uh, certainly any avenue where you can do a touch, where it's a person, be a per personal contact, a friend contact, an email, that is an opportunity to get your match name in front of in front of somebody. Got it. Got it. Yeah, it reminds me of something like when I started the, uh, the Three Gun Show, um, one of the most basic things that I read about marketing and getting your name out there was to – Put a link to your show or your YouTube channel, your Instagram, in your uh, in your email. So any email you send out has like one touch on there, and that's like a small example of uh, of what you're talking about. Like anyone that you meet is like a uh, potential customer. Well, in, in you know, in life, there's I used to use this term all the time when I would teach the field training officer program for the police department. It's the rule of tens. For every person that you know, they know 10 people. Mm -hmm. And you never know where your influence as an instructor is going to end. I kind of took that same philosophy as a match director. Touching people, when I say touch them, talk to them, you know, give them a flyer, whatever. 
you never know where that influence is going to stop because they're going to call a buddy up. Hey, I'm thinking about going to this match. I want somebody to ride along. Next thing you know, you got two guys coming or three guys or, you know, a husband and a wife or whatever. And next thing you know, they come there, they have fun. Then they're going back and telling other people, hey, man, you got to go shoot this match. Man, I had so much fun last year. And is there's a domino effect to where you end up with a waiting list, which is a good thing to have. Um, yeah. But but it's also one of those evils that you once you hit a standard, you must always constantly maintain that standard or keep improving it. Because if you don't, the last thing you want to do is let your customer down. Yeah, that's probably another good piece of advice, too, is, is to have like a big picture, like a long term view, because you know that whatever you do in that first year is going to, uh, uh, you know, pay dividends in that second year. And those two years yes. are going to pay dividends in that third year. And those three years are going to pay dividends in that fourth year. So exactly. if you look at it like that and you think like, this isn't just I'm I'm doing everything right now for May or for November when your match was. I'm doing everything right now for May. Like I'm doing everything right now for uh, November 2011, November 2012, November 2013. Yep. And, and to, to another caveat on that that people have to remember is – don't be afraid to ask somebody an opinion of what they thought from a match. And, you know, in the military, we used to do the, the, the three up, three down. Give me three positives, give me three negatives. And if somebody's got to sit there and struggle to give you three negatives, you're doing pretty darn good. But yeah. take those negatives because they may see something that you never saw. Like, hey, Larry, you know, I noticed that um, the trash cans were, were full – at the end of each day. Okay. So that's a note to me. Hey, make sure the staff is dumping the trash cans at lunchtime um, or, you know, trash is overflowing. It's just a small example, but certainly, Hey, you know, you could have used an extra porta potty down on stages, you know, five, six, and seven or something like that. Yeah, we, uh, so we are streaming this live on YouTube and we got an interesting, interesting comment from one of the, uh, the viewers right now. Um, what goes boom says that uh, there's an inverse relationship between match fee and volunteerism. The more I pay to shoot, the less I expect to work. Okay. Yeah. Um, my need, my need a little bit I, of clarification on that. How honest can I be with your viewers? As much as you want, man. Like we're so the the, I'm, I'm, the reason that I'm you're sorry. on the podcast here is to uh, yeah, you know, increase I'm the knowledge of the community. That. I'm sorry they have that view and understand their view, but understand if they don't want to give back to the sport in some time and some volunteerism or, or working, our sport's not going to last too long. Mm -hmm. And that's sincerely from the heart. I've been doing this for 29 years. And are there days that I go to a match that I don't want to pick up steel? Absolutely. I don't want to take targets. Absolutely. It's hot. It's muggy. It's miserable. I want to just sit and drink some water or it's raining. Yes. But you, you're shooting a sport because of the love of the sport. The love of the sport is part of that is giving back to that sport, whether it's you're working after you pay your match fee, got it. But that's kind of part of our DNA and our blood. We're, we're not, we're not in this um, we're in this to enjoy your shooting, to enjoy the second amendment. And that's what we always got to keep foremost in, in our minds. Yeah. Well said, you know, it, it kind of reminds me of Cub Scouts. Larry, you've got kids. Were you ever in Cub Scouts? Nope. Do you have them in Cub Scouts? No. So, we, um, we, we had, we, we, we did, uh, what's, what's the small little, little guys. Bears, tiger Cubs. What? Bear Cubs. I tiger know. Cubs. He, he started in that and, and, um, he did. He did, he wanted to play soccer and football and everything else. So one, something had to. Well, get. It's, it's probably the same in, in soccer and football too. But what what uh what was pointed out when I was younger was that the, uh, you know, the people that are leading seem to burn out the quickest. Like the the pack leader turns over every few years because they've got so much responsibility and so many things yep. to do. Whether if more people volunteer and and come in and help then it keeps, uh, keeps that burnout at bay for quite a while. And I've seen that recently with a lot of match directors too. Like he, it seems to be like a cycle, like three or four and just done. Yep. Yep. And uh, my grandfather always had an old saying, many hands make light work. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And uh, 
you know, if you enjoy what we do and you always want it to be there, you've got to give that time back into it. Um, so to ensure it's there, I mean, plain and simple, uh, you know, if you look at volunteerism across the board, Dave, I, a lot of people don't know, I spent 21 years as a volunteer firefighter uh, with the last 10 years that back in Dale City, Virginia. And, um, you know, I slept at the firehouse at nights and, um, you know, volunteerism has kind of really gone down. We, we see the numbers dwindling in the volunteer fire department. Um, you know, your, your civic groups, your Ruitan, your Elks, uh, your Lions Club, even in my mom's church, you know, um, obviously I don't go to that church because uh, I'm living out here in Kansas, but I, my church back home, there's, you know, a core group of people, when I say core group, three or four or five people that are doing a majority of the fundraisers and stuff like that. And that over time, like you said, will we'll cause burnout or the person moves away or something happens to them. Well, that's one less person now. And, and then you've a good leader always has to train their replacement, regardless of what you do. That, that's the combat mentality I've always had. You always let the entire team know what your plan is and what's going on because one day you may not be here. Yeah. That's a really good method of doing it. And it's interesting that you say like vol volunteerism as a whole is down because I've been kind of feeling bad, like in my little three gun bubble of seeing that and just being bummed out, but maybe it's more of like a, a societal problem, like a bigger societal problem. It is. It is. Um, and, in you know, more so probably in the last 10 years, but, you know, let's face it. When my, my parents, my mom stayed home when my brother and I were growing up. Now you have families that are dual income and sometimes three income or four income to make ends meet. Um, and you, your time to volunteers is dwindled. So if the society as a whole, that's, that's a, creation of many things you just can't point at the one thing and say oh that's the culprit let's go fix it oh yeah for sure yeah shoot got, well, I'm up any more questions yeah let's talk about some happy stuff man so <laughs> so oh, yeah. uh let's real quick let's let's uh put a bow on this like so how if you if we place you in charge of like a uh you know a uh, program to increase volunteerism what would you do like what, what can you and I do as, as a uh, regular guys that may, uh, may have some people to listen to them? Um, first off, you got to make it fun for everybody. Participants, both on the, on the volunteer side and, and um, the, the customer side. Cause let's face it, we're working. Yeah. And if you don't have fun at your work, what are you going to want to do? Yeah, you Not don't want to work, work there anymore. <laughs> exactly. So for me, I think that's the, one of the biggest things that if I'm in if I'm in charge of something, we're going to go go out fun and you lead from the front, not from the back. You don't push people; you pull them. Come on, hey, let's go do this. And I think that's a, that's a big thing that that's uh, that's actually missed nowadays is is people are willing to lead, but you've got to entrust people to do stuff and and such. So. That's a really good I mean, point, man. And I, I think I've I've definitely been guilty of uh, of that in the past. Like, I've shot some RO matches where they just like check the box, like the RO shot. Yes, it's not like did the ROs have a good time? You know, was right. it fun for them? Was it safe right. for them? Was it fair for them? And uh, it's like, well, this was a shitty time, and I didn't have fun. But then I've told a lot of people about it, and I probably turned a lot of people off from uh, from our owing um and that was bad <laughs> well you, you know one of the other biggest things that people have a tendency to do is they want to immediately squash somebody's enthusiasm or somebody's willingness case in point for an example of if i have somebody comes to me hey i want to design a course of fire and i want to put it on the ground okay great you design it let me look it over make sure it's safe you put it on the ground and then we'll see if we have to adjust anything. And then you make subtle suggestion for adjustments where like, Oh no, that's all wrong. You got to fix that. And it's like, Hey, um, you know, have you thought about turning that target just a little bit? Because, you know, if the shooter comes over here, they might clip the wall with a bullet and it goes in an unsafe direction. So you're getting them to start thinking about it versus all oh, that's all wrong. And 
and go fix it. And you've, yeah. def you've deflated that enthusiasm. Exactly. Like you're dumb. Never, never design a stage again. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's a good point. Now, I can't, I can't tell you that some of the things that AJ has done and he sets it out there and I walk up like, what the hell you do that for? That's a <laughs> dumbass. But he, he takes it all in good stride. You know, and I hope he's listening because he'll be sitting there laughing. And it's like, yep, I've done that. <laughs> yeah. Well, good. All right. So make it fun for people is the, uh, is the, the way to encourage volunteerism. Why do we do what we do, Dave? It's fun, man. Exactly. It fun, we wouldn't be doing it. And so exactly. This, Exactly. This reminds me of another conversation I've had recently of uh, um, someone said that, oh, they weren't going to shoot this match because uh, there was no prize table. And I thought like, wow, you shoot matches for prize tables? Like that that sounds terrible. Like your, your happiness and your enjoyment of something is contingent <laughs> upon whether you can take a trick at home with you, not like the experience as itself. Like you've never run a 5K. Can, can I just put that in? Financial perspective. Yeah. Okay. Let's analyze this real quick. By the What's way, let the me average preface fee? this by saying this is a really nice person and I don't hold any ill will, but no, 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 <laughs> go no. ahead. But, but that discussion has come up multiple times with people. Sure. And what's the average match fee for a three gun match? Let's just take a three gun match since it's the two fifty to three thirty. So let's call it two seventy five. Okay. Two seventy five. But let's let's make it for easy math, three hundred bucks. Yeah. Okay. So on average, a three gun match is two or three days long, right? Yes. A major. All right. So let's go three days. You're going to get there the night before, and maybe leave on the next day. So if it's the match is Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you're going to get there on Wednesday night, and you're going to leave on Sunday. So you got four nights a hotel. I stay in a lot of hotels with my work, and the average hotel bill, while it says $99, that's on a Tuesday through Thursday. You hit Friday, Saturday, it's like $150. Hmm. So let's do easy math with taxes and everything. Let's call it $150. Bucks. So four nights so in a hotel, that's $600. Bucks. We yep. haven't even, now we haven't talked about travel, getting there, and food. Yep. So let's talk about travel. Let's just call it, you, you drive, let's call it, and you're splitting some gas with some buddies. It's called 50 bucks. Yeah. And over four four days of, of meals, how much do you think you're gonna spend? 200 bucks in meals? Yeah, that sounds about right. Cause you're uh most people aren't doing like ham sandwiches, you know, it's uh right. Mexican dinner with a nice margarita. So let, before you've even fired one round, you have three hundred dollar match fee, six hundred dollars in hotel, two hundred dollars in meals. And fifty dollars for transportation to get you there. I got eleven fifty. Eleven fifty. How many guns can you buy for eleven hundred fifty dollars? Ah, well, I just saw Ruger put out a uh, a single action twenty two for two hundred seventy five bucks. So that's five. Could, yeah. four. <laughs> it's four. Yeah. All right. And and a so, nice brick of twenty two to go shoot them all. So that tells me right there that are people that are doing that. They're deep down in there. They're not doing it for the prize table. They're just saying that, hey, I'm doing it for, I, I want to shoot for prizes. What prize on that table is really worth, especially in a handgun match, is worth $1,150. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, we haven't calculated ammo in on that either. Well, and I always wonder, so I, I'm like an amateur sociologist. <laughs> I like to watch people and like try to figure out like their motivations and why they're doing it. So I always wonder like what, what is it that you need in your life as an individual that um, that makes you think like the prize is going to be it? Like, are you looking for like, I need to, I need to prove that I'm the best. I need to have like the, I need to have the biggest, shiniest trophy to put on the trophy wall. Like, what is it that you're getting from that prize that validates you as a human or that fills some sort of specific basic monkey brain need you know that you have you know what i'm saying it's like what what on like a base level is it that you get I, I think the only the only thing that i could come up with in, in a short time to answer that question dave is that's a measurement of accomplishment now oh, there you go does a trophy not do the same 
Well, it does, but I can't bolt a trophy onto my gun that I just picked up off the prize table like that dude for him. That's true. I yeah. mean, I mean, if 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 the trophy's capable of M lock and Magpul's got that new killer M lock system out, I mean, we could do. Yeah, we could do that, but you know, or I could flip it around trophies. and or I could flip it around and put it beside. You know, you've got the vortex sign up there. It's like, hey, I could put it right there. That become a data card. Yeah, there you go. All right, M-Lock trophies. You heard it here first. Well, you know, what's funny is the summer blast that I did at USPSA match, uh-huh. that was a trophy-only match, and it was a $75 match fee. Yes, and that's that's what I that's what I kind of like is like those those uh I don't know for for whatever reason we we were calling them major matches, but those like mini majors where there may not be a prize table, but all the people that want to go there are the shooters, right? So it's like seventy five bucks, it's a hundred bucks. The stage is going to be awesome, and we're just going to shoot. I, and I think, afterwards, we're going to have some cold beer. You know, going back to talking about the FN match a little bit. The biggest expense I had out of that was housing the match staff. But we yeah. also had a lot of match staff there. And, you know, every year I would turn in an expense report. I had all the receipts and everything and a, and a financial statement laid out every year. And our money constantly kept going back in the match. You would see new connexes there, um, you know, a, a new stat shack and such. But I firmly believe if somebody wanted to run a three-gun match, you could do a three gun match probably for 150 bucks for a match fee, and it's it'd be you know plaques only. But you got to understand something that you know for 150 bucks that's going to be extremely lean, um, and you might not, you know, I could do 125 dollars, but you're going to take targets, you're going to reset steel. Yeah, so you might have to uh, go pee in the woods. Yeah, yeah, you know, and you know it it. Depends upon what you want. Look, as I've gotten older in life, I just turned 50. And that was a hard number for me to accept and be able to say. (laughs) (laughs) But here's something that at 25 years old, I was okay driving a five-speed four-cylinder Cavalier because it got me where I wanted to go. But now I like my Sierra Crew Cab SLT four-wheel drive automatic. But they're not priced the same. But I get a whole lot more features and benefits out of that new that 2015 Sierra versus that Cavalier or Sunbird or my first car was a 79 Monza. Go go imagine that one. Um, so as we get it older in life, we realize those comfort features and everything are much better. That's the same way you got to look at matches. What's the features and benefits of the match that you're really paying for? Yeah, that's a really good point. And that's, I mean, that's, why like local matches are such an amazing value i mean granted they're they're one day usually four to five stages but you pay 30 to 50 bucks yeah that's that's awesome i mean if you if you think about it in in you know your overall expenses you're not housing any staff um just to give you an idea dave we had 80 i think 80 or 82 members of match staff in just the housing alone was twenty thousand dollars jesus well and that was like before vrbo's like now you could probably just get like a few houses 20 well, houses you know <laughs> we but it's also you also want to be able to say hey here's a nice accommodation that you can come home to the air conditioner works really well it's nice and clean you can go back and relax and stuff we, we put them at the match hotel i mean i thought we got a really good deal from from our match hotel because we held a, the the shooters banquet there the staff banquet there and their hotel filled up those five, five or six days that we were we were involved there. So that was a big income generator for them as well, too. Yeah, I think that's probably one thing that uh, matches miss a lot now is the uh, the match hotel thing. Is the, uh, mm-hmm. the the banquet doesn't seem to really happen at a lot of matches. It's kind of coming back, but a lot of times it'll be on the range, like at the venue, you know, at the mm-hmm. outside or something like that. But yeah, that's okay really as long as it's not raining. And the wind yeah, not blowing yeah. 60 miles an hour. <laughs> yeah, wind not. Uh, yeah, and, and, and I'll tell you, Dave, I, I took that from the Bianchi Cup. The first year I shot the Bianchi Cup, I thought it was so cool that everybody got together, 
you know, dress nicely, you get pictures, award presentations and everything. And I kind of did a rolled that version into a three gun, more of a blue collar type. We, we, we said, Hey, business casual. I never will forget Jesse Teschauer was showing up the first year with blue jeans and his shooting shirt on. I'm like, is this business casual? He goes, well, in my business it is. I'm like, Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So that's a, that's a really good point. Like the, uh, the banquet thing seems to be gone because I, I think a lot of people are like, you know, Hey, match is over. Give me that prize. I got to fly to catch. Yeah. 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 So, and, and I think people are trying to, um, you know, now that I, that I said that a lot, I think people are trying to maximize the amount of matches they can shoot by minimizing the time off work or something like that, or the time away from home. But, exactly. um, but it goes back to that Sierra thing. It's like, well, you can have 25 Cavaliers for what you pay for your, uh, your Sierra, you know? Exactly. But does that make it that much better? Exactly. Hmm. Quantity does not always replace quality. Yeah. Yeah, that's for sure. That is for sure, especially in firearms. <laughs> yeah, don't tell my wife that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, I'll, never mind. I'll retract that one. Well, yeah, okay. Well, Larry, you've given me a lot to think about, man. Like uh, some interesting concepts. I, I think uh, um, speaking to you has been like a breath of fresh air. Hopefully, the audience has taken something away from that too. So let's let's do a, a little bit of a transition here. Let's uh, let's put a pin in that one. Maybe we'll revisit it some uh, some other point in the future. But you've uh, you worked at FN. You worked yep. there for a number of years. You've done a, a pivot. You work for Vista Outdoors now. Uh, before we got going here, you sent me a product that uh, that just came out that you had a lot of development input in. Why don't we talk about that for a little bit here? Well, that product uh, just launched April 10th. That is the new Blackhawk T-Series holster. Um, mm -hmm. For the first time, Blackhawk really truly has a thumb drive duty rated holster. Mm -hmm. uh, for years, Blackhawk's been known for the Serpa, and the Serpa is 15, 16 years. It's been a great workhorse for Blackhawk. Uh, but we knew it was time that that transition had to, had to, had to uh, occur to that thumb drive. Ulster. So what you what you see there, Dave, is a um, it, we've taken technology and lessons learned from all the various holsters that Blackhawks developed. We basically laid all the holsters out on the table with all the engineers around. We said, hey, what's the attributes that you like the most out of that holster, that holster, that holster? And we kind of put them all together. Uh, lessons learned from doing the Epic holster, the, the, the Serpa holster to begin with, then the Epic holster, then the omnivore that we launched a couple years ago that you probably know about that takes 236 different handguns. Yeah. So those all came together. And what you're seeing now is, is a, is a truly innovative holster, um, thumb drive. It's all around the master grip principle where, you know, you have your basic grip on your handgun that, you know, your thumb shouldn't move or finger index finger should move from those locations. That's all in, in proportion to that. And we test the various different size hands to make sure they can reach the controls. Um, it is a, a dual uh, injected molded holster, which means there's a uh, outer shell of uh, glass filled nylon and an inner shell of a material called uh, Hytrel. And that Hytrel is also found in our ARC holster. Uh, I qu equate it to our shooting industry of you've heard of Delrin. And the yeah, first one yeah. really to bring Delrin to yeah, the shooting Delrin industry right over there. is uh, the, the Dawson Ice Magwell. Yep and how it's super smooth. Well, we took that same approach to the holster. That allows a couple things. At A, dual materials, it deadens the sound of the holster when you're reholstering, so it doesn't have that loud clunk or uh, like a hollow sound to it. The second thing it does, it allows the user to really clamp the holster down to their tight as they want that handgun to be in there for friction fit and our adjustment screw on the side so they can keep rattle and everything down. So if they're running, they don't have all that extra rattle. Then the last thing that it does is because that's that super slick material, it minimizes the wear on the finish of the handgun. Oh, which okay. as you know, with glass filled nylon, glass is an abrasive. Yep. The more glass you have in the, in the holster, the stronger the holster is, but then it becomes more abrasive on the sides of the gun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've got the, uh, you know, it's kind of funny cause a uh, long time ago, someone told me like the, the proprietary finish on a Glock was made it completely impenetrable to machine. Blah, 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 blah. Now everyone's like machining stuff. 
but I've got holsters that rubbed off the finish of lock slides. That's that's because of that. Yeah, exactly. Huh? That's that's pretty interesting. So we're not we're not saying that it will totally prevent the wear of the slides, but it's sure. certainly going to minimize it. And well, uh, I think we've got a we've got a winner there. You know, everybody that we've put it in our hands absolutely loves the feel of it, how easy it is to operate and uh, such. So it's pretty exciting. Yeah, it's it is exciting. Uh, I do so I do like the the thumb retention idea. Um, I just, in fact, picked up a, a new holster for uh, uh, an STI DVC-3 gun that I have that has a, a thumb break on there, but it's the uh, the hood. So mm -hmm. where you, you've got another thumb break on here and a hood option, right? So so in other words, you want me to go root through this box real quick to find one? Well, I just I want to know where the where it attaches. Hold on. Like, what's, what's the on retention part of it? Cause I'm I'm super curious on this because I was looking over the um, I'm just kind of vamping while you're you're gone here, but I was looking over the the data sheet that you sent me, and uh, it looks like it's a pretty good method of retention. But I want to know what that method is because I'm curious. Okay, so you know what? I'm also well grab my orange gun, the blue <laughs> yeah. gun. Heck yeah! Didn't know we were gonna do show and tell, did you? Yeah, I didn't know we were going to do show and tell, but luckily I'm in my office where I got all these accessories and toys. Okay, I'm going to try to show this into the camera there. Yeah, and you see good. right there, uh, there's a thumb release mechanism right there in between these two guards. Yes. So this, so if you're looking at it from the front, there's a guard right here, and we put that in holsters for law enforcement to keep a bladed hand from coming in here and activating the locking mechanism for a for, uh, handgun takeaway. Okay. So we also, from the back side, we bladed it as well from the back side. So it's protected from the front and the rear, not only from a rear takeaway, but debris, rocks, anything like that getting in there. So really, and what you're going to do, it's going to be kind of hard for me to, to show this, but I'm going to try to show it here. You're actually just, you're going to take your thumb, hit the release in just like this. It just goes in. Okay. Okay. So the draw sequence is when you come down to the gun, you're just simply going to come straight into the gun and your thumb hits the release. Oh. Just like that. And then you draw the gun. Interesting. So you're always, okay. if you remember with your handgun, you always want to work with your master grip principle right there. So the release is right there. So my thumb is just going to make a simple motion in like this. So what I've been teaching people, because I've got an extensive background in firearms teaching, instead of making a C to operate our competitors, the, the rotating hood and, and, mm -hmm. and pull back on the lever, you can make mm -hmm. a V. And as you come and seat your hand on the handgun, you're actually able to hit the release with no additional emphasis and emotion. Interesting. So on, on the, um, so, okay. So that has like, is that level two? Is that what they call that? This, this particular model here is a level two. Okay. And if you want me to grab a level three, we've got no, a that, spring that, activated hood. That's fine. I'm just trying to figure out what the, uh, the, nomenclature is because i'm kind of a neanderthal when it comes to that type of thing but so that's level two so where on the pistol does that level two retention hold is that on the trigger guard itself or is that somewhere else this this is actually on our trigger guard because that is a patent that we already have okay okay cool interesting well that looks like a sweet idea so it for larry for your information a couple of years ago i was uh, uh shooting blue ridge and uh, I tripped over, <laughs> I tripped over a stump and uh, did an endo, like a serious somersault. Lost my pistol and uh, uh, was DQ'd and had to go home. So since then, I've really liked the active retention on a pistol holster, and uh, this seems like a pretty cool solution. So I was looking at your your product sheet, and of course, you guys come out with like the most popular police guns first, right? So every kind well, of Glock and keep in, and say P320. Keep in mind, this is driven duty gun first because sure. that's a market so that's my next question we really want to want to attack and, and go to um but we have what we call our l2c compact versions uh, that are going to be geared toward the commercial market everything is meeting to law enforcement duty standards so a, a police officer can uh carry the exact same holster that you carry if you want to carry it every day can is carrying that on duty we're not separating any different standards or anything it's all the same 
Um, so what you'd want to look for in, in for a three gun application is the L2C. Um, okay. And that is, you know, we've got those right now for the Glock and the SIG 320, the Glock 43, uh, the M&P Shield 940, and um, the Glock uh, 19 and 17. And that has uh, the same level two retention? Correct. Correct. Okay. So one, one of my focuses, because of the, my law enforcement background, is a lot of times when you have a police officer that comes off patrol and goes to be a detective, they get issued a completely different holster. They're like, oh, here's your issued holster. Well, they don't even send them out to the range to get them familiar with it before they're carrying it on duty. This way now, that holster can be issued, that L2C holster can be issued. It's the same exact release mechanism that they have in their L2D or L L3D duty holster. So there's no training switch over or anything like that for officers. Gotcha. Okay. So uh, if you are a competitor, you've got a you know Glock 34, you're shooting the new SIG, uh, P320, it's a good option for you. Now for, for guys like me that have gone like super gamer and are shooting 2011 platforms, can we expect uh, something like that coming down the line? Not for a while, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, however, um, I just got done our second phase of, of um, the T-Series and in there is for 1911. So it would be yeah. applicable for IDPA, single stack shooters. Um, and, and Dave, let me, let me say this. I've practiced and played with this holster. I've been working on developing this holster now for the last 18 months. And I'm just as fast out of a level two duty holster as I'm a friction retention holster. Nice. That's, that's how, good. That's how fast this holster is. Yeah. Yeah. So with, uh, you know, with one of the competitor holsters that you were talking about there, um, I found with that thumb release, you know, it wasn't even that much of a difference after I trained with it. So it's good to know that it, this is the same type of uh, deal here. Hey, and listen, don't get me wrong. Those guys built a great holster. Um, sure. It's just, you know, we needed something different than a Serpa. And I was able to bring this product to the market. And I think it's going to be a great product. And really, I, I, I think this product is, Serpa came out 2003, 2004. I think we're sitting right now and seeing what can be the next Serpa or as big as the Serpa. Sure. Well, and I've, I've been a vocal critic of the Serpa for some time now. So this looks like a, a more safe option as, as well. So that's a good thing that for you guys to have in the market. Hey. And absolutely, this is not for their look. There's the diehard Serpa guys out there that absolutely love the Serpa and will have nothing else but the Serpa. This is really geared toward that segment of the the population that doesn't like the Serpa or doesn't want to use the Serpa. So, mm -hmm. cool. Well, so Larry, we've been talking for an hour and twenty minutes here. I feel like I know you, and I can tell you anything. So, I'm just going to tell you, like for a long time, like Blackhawks seem like just the, the Walmart junk brand. And in the last few years, I've seen like a huge turnaround where Vista is actually putting in some effort and creating new products, putting, you know, good people, people like yourself in, uh, in positions of uh, influence there. And well, the products I'm seeing coming out of Blackhawk are like a lot of stuff that I, I would never have guessed in a million years. Well, hey, it's Glenn. I'm in the show and tell room then. <laughs> What else we got? That's a brand new holster. What is that? That is a Black Hawk premium leather antique brown holster. Huh. No kidding. Yeah. This is this is something that I developed and brought to the market last year. So basically all our our leather holsters are handmade out of Italy. And oh, wow. uh these holsters, because of the way we finish them, no two holsters are the same. This is actually a hand dyeing process that goes over top of it. So no two holsters are the same. So you're getting a semi custom holster without the huge custom price. Right. Okay. Well, I mean, again, more stuff that I never thought I'd see from Blackhawk. So what? Uh, <laughs> what's uh, what's on the horizon for Blackhawk then? Um. Well, obviously the T-Series is on the horizon. We just hired a new on-gun accessory manager that's going to go through and revamp all our on-gun accessories. Um, I'm kind of looking really forward to some cool stuff. And, 
Now, you talk about cool stuff from Blackhawk. Do you want to see something cool from Uncle Mike's? Yeah, Take sure. Your handgun? Yeah, that was my first holster. This is for a 22, but... That's Uncle Mike's? That's Uncle Mike's, brother. Huh. What do you think? That's that cool. Pretty, it looks like a it looks like a custom holster that you would uh, buy from one of the the sweet manufacturers. So it's the Uncle Mike's green inside with a carbon fiber exterior. Hmm. Now we'll have this for the STIs, the DVC three gun, the the DVC limited, um, your Glock thirty four thirty fives, your uh, M&P long slides, your Canic. Uh, SIG 320, all your competition line holsters or handguns, that will have this holster for that. Comes with a belt mount. MSRP is $44.95. Wow. <laughs> that's, uh, that's a good price point. So as you can see, I'm kind of doing some cool, exciting stuff. Um, not only just to Blackhawk, but Uncle Mike's. Um, I'm kind of excited for the next year. I really am. Yeah, that's pretty cool, man. I'm uh, I'm I'm excited to see that. It's it's cool when uh so again just being frank when like a, a company that has become like a punchline over the years completely turns around and is actually putting out like quality products, you know. So I mean that's that's fantastic. Well, I definitely um when I get my um L2C samples for my uh for the T series, I'll I'll get you one over so you can play with it. I'm sure you've got a Glock, don't you? Oh yeah, I always joke I've got a pillowcase full of Glocks. So right, <laughs> they're all nine millimeter. Most guys that have guns have Glocks. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm never more but, than arms width from a Glock in my home. So, <laughs> but yeah, we'll get you we'll get you one to play with, and you know if you you know give us you know your your feedback on on a show one night or whatever, that's up to you. But uh, certainly uh, um, get you to play with it, and you can see that uh, Blackhawk is on the comeback. Yeah, I'd, I'd definitely uh, love to check it out. I'm I'm a super mechanical uh, nerd, which is why you see all these uh, tools and gun parts behind me. So I'm always interested in how things work. So yeah, I'd love to play with one of those, check it out. Yep. Cool. Well, Larry, I won't take up uh, much more of your evening here. We've uh, we've been going for quite a while now, but I want to first of all thank you for uh, for your time and for just sharing the knowledge and the uh, the heritage of everything that you've done over the years and uh, sharing that with the community tonight. Hey, Dave, I, I appreciate you having me on and hopefully for all the viewers out there, you guys were able to get an insight of a little bit of, you know, how I evolve some things and uh, give somebody some insights of uh, why we should uh, continue in the shooting sports and be those uh, proponents of the second amendment through, through shooting. Absolutely. So, uh, Larry, one last final thought or piece of advice. If you got something you want to leave the audience with, just go ahead and shout it out right now. Well, I'll, I'll say this for all the new shooters out there or, or people that are just getting into shooting. I will, I will tell you this. Invest good money on, in equipment and ammo when you go to a match. The last thing you want to do is try to save 20 bucks on your match ammo and that ends up costing you 30 or 40 places in a match performance because your ammo didn't want to feed, wasn't reliable. Um, I equate it to you own a top fuel dragster and you're trying to run a, a, a quarter mile in three and a half seconds on pump on leaded gas. You're just not going to be able to do it. So spend a few extra dollars, save that, save the inexpensive ammo for practice and things like that, but run good match ammo when you go to shoot at a, at a, at a major match. That is excellent advice. Uh, I wish you would have given me that back in 2011 when I first started. <laughs> well, Thanks. You know, Thanks, you buddy. You didn't have me on the show soon enough. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's excellent advice. I, I totally agree there. Well, Larry, this has been a, a, a pleasure, man. We're going to have to do this again uh, soon, sooner than later. And I uh, hope to see you on the range in the future, man. Thank you. All right, buddy. Take care. Good talking to you. You too. Unload show clear.